The educator Dr. Maria Montessori once said, The child developing harmoniously and the adult improving himself at his side make a very exciting and attractive picture. Welcome to Montessori Education with me, Jesse McCarthy, where we talk raising children and educating students while bettering ourselves right alongside them. I got connected with Lenore Skenazi through a mutual friend who was like, Jesse, you and this woman have to talk. So about a month ago, we had a call. For those of you who don't know who Lenore is, she is a successful journalist. She authored the book Free Range Kids, and she is a mother that got herself into trouble years ago when she let her then nine-year-old son take the New York City subway home on his own. I'll tell you up front, I, I am not a fan of people who say that children should be able to just do whatever they want, go wherever they want. I, I think that would be a disaster. And and I'm not just saying that kind of theoretically, like I've seen that happen. The classrooms and home lives where children are, quote, free to just run about and play all the time is far from helpful in my view. As Maria Montessori once put it, quote, that is the kind of freedom we give to cats and lizards, end of quote. I tend to agree with her on that. But Lenore is not full on free range in the sense that, you know, anything goes. As you'll hear in our discussion, her style of free range parenting is really about allowing children to develop naturally and freely. But this is always within limits set by thoughtful adults. And when you think of it, every real range by definition is limited. So in the proper sense, I like to think of free range here as similar to Montessori's freedom within limits. Something I'd say that kids and our culture really need more of. Like from my vantage, children today, they either get way too much like of what many see as freedom, which really just becomes, you know, just allowing your children to do what they want. Or they get way too many limits. And that's, I see, kind of as a relic of, you know, the more traditionalist past. So not surprisingly, it seems like our broader adult culture is regularly in, you know, a battle between something like this too. So connected to the idea of free-range kids and maybe to us even becoming more free-range grown-ups ourselves, this episode is all about questioning you know, popular practices today around forced limits. As a warning, it, it's a little bit edgy. Lenore and I get into a few touchy topics, like leaving young kids in the car alone, letting children's feelings get hurt at school sometimes, you know, parent anxiety, and fear, and there's there's even some talk of sex. Actually, I think before I give give away too much, I think that's good as way of introduction. So, so here we go. Glad to have you on, Lenore. It's you know we spoke a little bit ago, and I gave you know gave the li- listeners a little bit of background about you beforehand. So I kind of want to just you know knowing who both of us are, just skip the small talk and hop right into the the hard hitting okay. stuff. Yeah. Die. Okay. Cool. So my the big question jumping in is, what do you see as one of the biggest problems? in parent today, whether it's the biggest or one of the biggest, whatever, what, what's a problem in parenting today? Oh my God, there's so many, but I would say that, um, first of all, everybody always thinks I'm the anti helicopter parent and I'm totally not that I am anti helicopter culture okay. because even if you want to be the most, uh, you know, either free range or completely lackadaisical, any kind of parent you want to be other than a helicopter, you're not allowed. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, there yeah. are, There are schools around the country where your child is not allowed to get off the bus, a school bus I'm talking about, unless there's an adult there waiting to walk them home. And it could be, there was one lady who wrote to me, it was the bus stopped at the bottom of the, of her driveway. And yet she had to come out there and stand out there. It's like, okay, do you mind just quitting your job, coming home every day, (laughs) three in the afternoon? Forty-five. sometimes bus a little late and waiting there for this completely meaningless kabuki of parenting to walk your child you know which is an insult to the the child uh, you know the human spirit yeah <laughs> the mom and it's just a, it, the, the neighborhood is just crazy so so, ba- so basically so, what you're saying off the off the top here is that you don't want to be bashing parents but it's a cultural phenomenon yeah. at this point it is a cultural phenomenon that has just it just keeps 
growing. It's like yeast. It just keeps gobbling. <laughs> Normal childhood. I'm I, like, I have a yucky picture in my mind. I like the child. visual there. Yeah. <laughs> right. But the point is that like, you know, you want your kid to walk home from school. Some schools won't release kids. You want your kid to walk to the park. Sometimes parents get arrested for letting their kids play in the park because it's mistaken for negligence. You want your kid to do their own homework, but the homework is 10 times too hard for them to do at that age. You want them to just read for fun, but you have to fill out a reading log. And then you have to put post-it notes in the book that prove that you're reading, which is just a surefire way to make reading a total drag. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and I mean, stepping back here, so you're basically saying there's this societal pro problem that's actually making parents be overprotective. So it's not even, oftentimes it might not even be coming from the parents, but it's like, it's a requirement right. of life today that you do this. I mean, and I mean, it's the extreme exactly. cases, but they're real that you could literally be arrested for maybe not being so overprotective in some of these situations. Correct. And I'm certainly the person that people write to when they are arrested or when they're investigated um, for crazy things like literally letting their kids walk home from the park. Um, somebody wrote to me recently that their kid gets a cookie from the free cookie place at the at the supermarket. I think this is in Georgia on the kid's way home two blocks from uh, his I don't know karate class or something. Mm -hmm. And the police keep telling the parents, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And they keep saying, actually, we are. And it's this almost a standoff at this point because they want to, they, they trust their child. They trust their community. They just are not allowed to, to give their child that independence that they feel is not only, um, you know, good for them, you know, that they don't have to suddenly go back and drag the kid two blocks, but, but it's good for the child. The child yes. shouldn't be treated like a, an amoeba, you know, or yeah. an embryo. So I wonder, you know, and I'm going to come back to this, I think a little bit later, I wanted to raise this with you, but it almost sounds like it's like we need free range adulting back, like the, the ability to be free as an adult and make your own decisions. Oh, really? I mean, like, sometimes I just think of like, what is the movement about? It's, so, it's sort of about restoring um, independence to children, because mm -hmm. we think that taking that away from them stunts them. You know, if kids are not allowed to grow, they're not allowed to grow. Mm -hmm. right? But I also think it's restoring trust. It's restoring, I mean, it's restoring trust in your community, in your own parenting, in your child, and then a little bit also in um, statistics, because statistically we're at a 50-year crime low. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you're going by stats, you know, you, you playing outside when you were a kid is uh, was actually less safe if you were growing up in the 70s, 80s, 90s, or aughts than it is now. So what but it's also... I just wanted to say it's yeah, also restoring fine. trust in in um, sort of mother nature gave kids, you know, curiosities so that they would explore and figure things out and screw up and learn from those experiences and not just from us being with them every second saying, see, honey, you're walking home. Walking begins with W, but has a silent L. And that is a word that has a, you know, and it rhymes with talk. I mean, not everything has to be, not every teachable moment has to be taught by an adult. And yet, we're saying that adults have to be with kids all the time because either they'll be teaching them something valuable or they'll be protecting them. Okay. And in fact, there's so much that kids can get just from, you know, sort of thinking, dawdling, looking around, so, um, exploring. Yeah. So if I can pull out a, f a couple of things here that that seem to be coming from this is one is there seems to be a fear that if we as adults aren't actively educating or teaching children at every moment, that they're not going to grow up to be healthy individuals. So there's there's this false perspective that children can't naturally learn on their own from their own observation of us, from the observation of the world and so forth. So that's one thing that seems to be coming out. Um, and then the Absolutely. second the second seems to be culturally, there seems to be a kind of an ignorance or a gullibility with whether it's news <laughs> reports about violence, about your child getting snatched, something like that, yeah. that doesn't actually correlate or connect with the facts, the statistical facts of how much violence is occurring and or, or even, you know, this taking a child off the street. So are those two no. things basically getting at what you're saying. Uh, yes, I, I think you, you've just um, summed them up really well. What I sometimes say is that there are the twin fears that are stalking American parents is one is that, like you said, your kid will be kidnapped, raped and eaten. And the other is that they won't get into Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> and either way, these are complete disasters that therefore you must be with them every single second of the day, either, you know, supervising them so they're safe or um, putting them in some structured program that will give them a leg up. And so they're not wasting any time, you know, yeah. waste, not a minute. And yeah. uh, it's, it's a huge burden on kids, but it's also it ends up being a really big burden on moms mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, parents in general, but moms in specific, if you have to be driving your kid everywhere and then, you know, sitting there for the 45 minutes, because what are you going to do in the 45 minutes while they're taking a lesson or whatever? And then you drive past the pizza place and decide to pick up a pizza for dinner. And then you have to take the triplets out of the car because you're not allowed to let them wait in the car while you pick up the pizza, even though you can wave to them <laughs> through the pane glass window. I mean, suddenly you have zero free time for any of your own pursuits or, or, um, yeah. or career. And let me, let me pause on two things you noted even here. So one is just this show, Montessori, Montessori podcast on my end is really about us as adults growing and enjoying our time right alongside the children. So I'm happily you're noting that it's actually beneficial for parents if they stop, you know, hovering over their children all the time or culturally, if we have this view that we should be hovering. Um, and then the second thing, which you're in this world, uh, Lenore, that's kind of, you know, free range. And so I got to step back and say, I think what you just said about leaving the triplets in the car is going to be pretty radical to a yeah. lot of parents today. Although it seems yeah. like, oh, yeah, leave them in the car. So just can you just briefly talk about what you just said is leaving the children in the car while you go in and get your pizza? So and yeah, Lenore, but see them through the plate glass window. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> just I I know you said that, but I that is going to be radical to a large percentage of even listeners here. The Montessori is very much about allowing your child to have freedom. You know, thinking about the child's nature. But the idea of potentially leaving the car, the kids in the car, that that can be frightening to some. So can you talk a little no, bit more I about totally that? I totally understand. Yeah, and I understand why it would be frightening because. We are told about the, the, I can't even talk about them, the tragedies when children um, are forgotten in cars uh, and, and therefore perish. It's just horrible. But those stories are literally when parents don't remember that their kids are in the car and they go into work. It's not um, when you're running a brief errand and you've decided that, um, you know, it makes sense uh, for all sorts of reasons, uh, convenience being one that is not a shame. Um, mm -hmm. For yep. you to just run in. And, and I mean, if we're going to go back to statistics, uh, you're actually, you're statistically more likely, your kid is more st statistically more likely to, I hate talking about this topic. I'm so sorry I got off on it. But your kid is more statistically <laughs> likely to die in the parking lot being hit by a car than waiting in the car during a brief errand. We, we yeah. don't get that story. And I think the reason we don't get that story is, first of all, it's very unlikely that they'll, you know, it's very safe either way. Taking your kid in with you is very safe. Letting your kid wait for five minutes in the car is also very safe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what we hear of is the the terrible anomalies. And what's interesting is like, well, if they're both very safe and yet neither of them is perfectly safe, right? Nothing is perfectly safe. Even no. if you brought the kids home and they ran up the stairs and somebody falls down the stairs, you know, there's there's no such thing as perfect safety. But there was this fascinating study that was done at the University of California, Irvine. Oh, that's where named, I'm from. Uh, you're kidding. No, it's not really wow. where I'm from, but it's where I grew up, Irvine, California. Okay. Yeah, I know UCI okay. well. Okay, well, I love the people there. And there okay. were three people um, in a team, I think it was headed by Barbara Sarneka. She's certainly the one I keep talking about, um, that did this interesting study where they asked um, a team, uh, they asked five different groups of people. They just divided people you, you, randomly. You're in group one, two, three, four, five, um, about different scenarios. And one of the scenarios was, um, a, a more more scary than mine, because uh, mine was just a five minute story we were just talking about. But um, a child is left in the car for half an hour, and they told the first group of people, group one, that the kid was left in the car only because the mom was dropping off a book at the book drop, and she got hit by a you know by a Mack truck and was knocked out cold for half an hour, and that's the reason she couldn't get back to the car mm -hmm. for half an hour. Group two was told, you know these these people do not hear what the other group is hearing. Yeah. Group two was told. The mom had to do something for work, and it took her half an hour. Group three is told she's exercising. Four is volunteering, or I don't, I don't know the order of that. And five is she was going to meet her lover, and she <laughs> met her lover for half an hour. Okay. And they asked each of these groups to gauge um, what level of danger they thought the child was in. Mm -hmm. And the group where the mom was knocked out cold through no fault of her own, they put the kid in like a five, you know, okay. and then the out of what? So what's the five? Five out of ten. It's I'm not giving you the exact numbers. It okay, but it generally numbers. ten would be ten, 10 would be the highest ten danger. The highest, okay. right? So five is when she was knocked out cold. Okay. Um, when she was working, it was a six. When she was doing something else, it was a seven. When she gets to the, you know, when she's going to the lover, people gave it a ding, ding, ding. It's a ten. Yeah, a 10. that's crazy. And I want to see this. Well, what was so interesting about this is that clearly you're, you're Oh, by the way, yeah, <laughs> Lenore is actually walking the streets of New York City as she's speaking on this, funny I'm enough. So. 
mind you. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not for a living. <laughs> Lenore, this is why it's this is one of the reasons why I'm having Lenore on because she's like she just straight up says that. That's pretty funny, Lenore. <laughs> right. So anyways, what I wanted to say over the Oh, uh, we should hold up. Yeah. Hold up. Let's let that pass because it's it's drowning you right. out a little. Okay. So people people were giving their um, they were only gauging the level of danger that they thought the child was in. But it went from five when the mom wanted to get back to the kid to 10 when the mom was doing something sinful. Yeah. And so really we were morally judging the mom and going from there, the, our moral judgment clouded our danger judgment. Yeah. So we were, so that's really interesting. So that's why we think that a kid is in danger for the five minutes the mom is picking up the pizza but not in danger for the five minutes when she takes them across the parking lot and picks the pizza up. And I think it's because we've decided that any mother who takes her eyes off her child for any amount of time is a bad mom. And that is what, what I'm trying to. Find. Yeah. And I think, and I, I think your point is right on. And one thing I, I would add, and I think it's related to that sinful point is that I think there's a general sense that parenting is a sacrificial, you know, process. And yeah. and I it the idea of your lover is probably the exact opposite. It's like there's actually some interest I have in life. It's somebody I actually want to go have, you know, whether it's romantic, sexual, whatever. Um assuming you're not cheating on somebody and doing something ridiculous, but you know, it's something you really want in life. And that's the worst because you're really going after something that's enjoyable for you versus sacrificing your time, your enjoyment and everything else for your child. Now, I don't think they have to be one or the other, but I think that's kind of how it's been put in life for, for many of us. Um, so right, I don't. So that's why I totally agree. And there's a really neat book written by a woman named Kim Brooks. Okay. Um, and I don't want to talk about cars the whole time because it's, it's totally, you know, some people, you know, will will see this as just a, an automatic, like, let me turn off Lenore. She's crazy. And yeah. the cars are not my main thing. But Kim Brooks was arrested for letting her kid wait in the car literally five minutes while she went to pick him up some earphones because they were going back on a plane that night. And what she came to recognize is that this is, um, you know, considering the kid was not in any statistical likely danger, mm -hmm. um, why was she arrested? And uh, she sees it as sort of a backdoor war on women, hmm. right? And so why would people say that? Uh, here's an interesting fact about that same study. And then, please, let's talk about education or something. Yeah. But when they ask the same question about a man leaves his kid in the car mm -hmm. um, and the first, you know, group A hears that he was, you know, dropping off the book and hit by the Mack truck and group B hears that he was working on up to the lover. The, for the man, group A and group B, whether he was dropping off the book and meant to get back in 10 seconds or was working, it was the same level of danger. So for the man, mm. they see work as a necessity. Yeah. It's a, it's a non-negotiable thing. He has to do it. What do you expect? You know, poor guy. Yeah. But for a woman, it's already a little bit of guilt. Like, why is she working instead of um, immediately being, you know, always yeah. being with her kid? And that's a level of guilt that moms live with all the time yeah. and then add the guilt of the of the danger that we have sort of overestimated um it's along a lot of with guilt the idea that they're in danger of falling behind because you're not you know sitting with them and reading with them and doing your letters and um you know taking them someplace stimulating all of which i did with my kids but if you're not yeah. doing it every single second yeah then there's something again, wrong Right. Yeah. So I wonder, and historically, that pro I could totally see that building up because historically women have been treated as less, um, and why not shame them or guilt them a little bit more than the male? So I think that that probably would fit. Um, now, before we do hop off the the car thing, I wanted to tell you something because you know, this car talk. I know, right, but this car. is I want to even actually go to animals because interestingly, when I first started like looking into Lenora, a mutual friend of ours put us connected us. Um, I saw this whole car issue, leaving your child in your car, and one of the first things for me because I have a, I have this dog is leaving your dog in the car. So I started to research this, and there's a lot of fearful videos and you know articles on. Do never leave your dog in the car. So I was like, wow, if they're really arguing, you should never leave your dog in the car, then man, a, a child. But I started to actually research what these people were saying. And every time they did a study, it was like 95 degrees out. And the person decided to leave their dog in the car with the windows like cracked a little bit. 
So it's right. fascinating that even the research done sometimes is done so poorly and then somebody will use one study to extrapolate right. and make these conclusions that just scare the hell out of everybody. So um, yes. so I, I haven't done deep research into you know this phenomenon, but the reality is if you're doing a study and you're actually concerned, really concerned, you should really think about the, the different uh, variables that you have there. So like obviously if you leave a child in the car in like, you know, Compton at 1 a.m. in the morning while you go into like, you know, you're a drug dealer or something like that is that your baby probably will be in danger, you know? So it's I think just the context is so important, too, in any discussion we're having about anything really with babies um, and dogs, too. Right. Obviously. And let me, you know, people will say and it's true that cars heat up quickly. But the point of um, the study that I did of this topic is mm -hmm. that um, children don't die during a brief errand. They die when they're forgotten in a car and it actually yeah. the average time is 4.6 hours so yeah. um yeah. and by the way it's, i it's, i want to just uh, go point, for it i just want to say it's up to the parents i mean if if you know that you're going in to get um muffins for your kids or you have to pick up something for work or you're picking up supper um and, and you know that this is you know you're not going to go into the dry cleaners and and then oh wow you know i Maybe I should become a dry cleaner. Can I spend the day, you know, shadowing you? <laughs> Forget and about your child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. that's probably that's that's extremely unlikely to happen. And yeah. knowing that you're just going in, getting something, and coming out, that should be up to you. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, if you're scared for your child, or you don't, you just don't want to do it, don't. But yeah. if you feel like it's okay, parents make so many decisions on a seat of the pants basis all day long. You know. Your, your your wife's car breaks down and so you have the you know the seven-year-old is home with a cold and the five-year-old's there do, do you leave them there for 10 minutes while you go to the to the train yep, to pick her up yep. or not I mean it should be up to you it should not be up to somebody who has a you know other Some people bureaucrat can, or something they would, right that they other people can do it completely differently I mean that's that's the great thing about freedom we're free to choose but if you're not literally leaving your child in true statistical danger, then um, let's not call it danger. Yeah, yeah. And hold, you know, Lenore, hold on one sec because I'm hearing the, now I'm hearing the vacuum cleaner here and I want to make sure it's not picking it up so crazily. So um, okay. hold on one sec. So yeah, so I just paused for a second because there was some background noise, but I know we were ending on, you know, more individual choice in parents' lives. So giving them the opportunity to say, when do I think it's safe? And definitely not going off those rare occurrences. I know I threw Compton out there. I'm not throwing everybody under the bus who lives in Compton because I have some friends who who from Compton, great individuals, and they weren't you know getting drugs at 1 a.m. But you'll have those rare cases, right? And we don't want to. I, I was thinking as you were speaking, Lenore, that we don't want to make our world's laws and the way that we treat each other based on the rare kind of crazies or the rare moms or dads that are just lost their mind and left their child in a car literally for an hour. Like we don't want to base our existence on the bad cases. Right. right? So, right. And I don't think we want to base our parenting decisions on the worst case scenarios in terms of like out of the blue crimes that there's no way to predict. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, like I was talking about before, there's so many schools that won't let the kids get off the bus in the afternoon, the school bus. And I think it's based on the idea that they could be kidnapped. And, you know, the I actually have an amazing statistic about this, which is if you wanted your child for some reason uh, to be kidnapped by a stranger and, and I think held overnight, do you know how long you would have to keep your child outside unsupervised for this to be once again statistically likely to happen? Do you know how long? You no, know, give it to us. Just, Let's hear. I have no clue. You don't want to just guess wildly because you'll guess <laughs> wrong and then I'll be able to laugh. I don't want to over, I don't want to overdo it. And I don't want to underdo it. But I would say it's probably, you know, hundreds of hours, if not, you know, years. But I don't know. It's more than hundreds of years. It's 750,000 years. <laughs> so it's actually an impossibility <laughs> is what you're saying. <laughs> well, it's not an impossibility, but it's sort of like the, the winning Powerball ticket. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's, it's just because something extremely rare is going to happen. Do you, you know, you, you can't base your life on that or really you would never be able to feed your kids solid food. Yeah, because the can fear. Choke and you can't, right, yeah, you can't so and I wonder... Food, you know, and I wonder, because you've been talking, you know, we've kind of gone deeper or the higher altitude here on this show. And I wonder if a lot of this is, again, coming back to the way that we were even raised or educated ourselves to not understand statistics and not understand how to think as adults or as human beings. 
Well, uh, two things. First of all, I just have to give a shout out to Montessori because I've spoken at, at a bunch. Uh -huh. And once when I was at one of the Montessori schools, it was in Napa Valley, somebody sat down and showed me how you guys learn math. And I yeah. think that if anyone understands statistics, it would be you. Yes. <laughs> it would be, well, I would you know, say. I'm sorry, because they really do. They, they taught math so much faster. Yeah. And I was I was and I was going to ask you about Montessori a little bit later. But my thing is, you know, as much as we're trying to promote and get Montessori out there, um, us as adults, most of us did not have Montessori. So we didn't get that that math material that you're referring to. So we're right. a little bit more uh, <laughs> ignorant. Right. But here's the deal. This is okay. where I get back to not blaming parents again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, statistics don't move anybody anyhow. I mean, that 750,000 year thing is interesting, but it doesn't change what people feel is safe or not safe. Yeah. And um, here's what I've realized is that a couple of things. One is that the brain works like, like Google. And if you ask it, you know, where can I find a, you know, a cheap, uh, you know, ramen place in Midtown? You know, it will give me a three or four choices on the first page, and, and that will be, those will be relevant to my question, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But when I ask, is my kid safe at the bus stop, up come the easiest stories for my brain to find, which yeah. are the story of Aton Pads, taken from bus stop, or J.C. Dugard. And ironically, these are the least relevant to me. They are so anomalous. They're separated by about 40 years. Um, and what and are those examples? Because I don't, I don't know if oh, no, uh, yeah, the sorry, audience no, will be familiar with those. Sure. I mean, I hate bringing them up because they're very, very sad. But Aton Pates uh, was a six-year-old boy kidnapped from a bus stop here in my city, New York City, mm -hmm. in 1979. And J.C. Dugard was taken from a bus stop um, when she was 11 and um, you know, kept, held captive for 18 years in California. So these mm -hmm. are stories that are so shocking, so upsetting. Um, and they have a whole story on them, which is why they're easy to bring up. Whereas I once calculated how many children have like been born since Aton's disappearance in 1979. It's 160 million children, yeah. and we can't bring those up. So, but the story, um, the story sticks, but the statistics don't. Is what you're kind of getting at here? Exactly. And and not only does the story stick because it's so easy for us to remember them, um, it feels more relevant we believe that anything that is easy to remember it's called the availability heuristic if it's an easy story to remember we think it's relevant because back you know for the first million years of human evolution it was if you saw somebody eat i'm looking at some clover here in this park i'm in you saw somebody eat that flower and then they died that was an extremely relevant piece of information for you to keep in your brain and so the bad stories are are easy to retrieve but now we have bad stories that are not just from our neighborhood and the plants that are dangerous and the and the animals that you have to avoid we hear we hear stories from you know from new york and california and uh wherever the worst possible story is and those are in our brains now and they we we retrieve them thinking that they're they're relevant when actually they're just scary yeah so and then what you're basically saying i know you have a background in journalism too right I do. Yeah. So, so 15 years at the New York Daily News. There you go. So I, I think, and you know well, and a lot of us forget this, but headlines obviously sell. So uh, those two okay. headlines that you just talked about, those stories, I mean, those are phenomenal headlines. I mean, they're very disturbing. They're not, you know, the fun things we'd want to hear about, but they are, that's a headline. Now, the other thing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the other thing, like, you know, 100 million children never, you know, taken anywhere from anybody, you know, from a park, a bus right. stop, it's just never going to make the news. So, but that is going to just by psychology and the way that we work as humans often emotionally stories and vivid stories stick with us. So we've just got to, yeah. you're basically saying as a culture, we should be on the lookout and be aware that that might affect us in such a more profound way and just guard against that. Yeah. If you can, I mean, it's hard because it feels um, unnatural. It feels like almost um you're being like you know uh, mr spock you know it's mm -hmm. like does not compute 160 million children fine yeah uh but but the thing that is interesting to me is that it's not like i mean crime is at a 50-year low mm -hmm. now and so when my mom was sending me to school and i walked to school at age five and my crossing guard was 10 because back then we trusted kids to to have some responsibility um she wasn't expected to 
go over in her mind, oh no, what if she's taken? I'll feel so terrible. Yeah, yeah. I can remember that, that story. And so yeah. I feel bad because today's parents are almost expected to think of these worst case scenarios in a way that our parents weren't expected to do. It's sort of the hallmark of good parenting is to point out all the terrible things that could happen and how guilty and terrible you feel if they did, rather than to trust your kid and trust the odds and sort of, you know, shoulder shoulder on. Yeah, and we and I get this a lot when working with parents that are attending Montessori schools. And the question that comes up is because, you know, we put a lot more confidence in children to solve their own problems in a classroom. And it's a mixed age classroom. So you can imagine, so let's say it's That's a, so you know, three to six year olds or six to nine year olds all in the same classroom. And you've got a parent that comes in with a three year old and you say, oh, they're going to be in a classroom with five and a half year olds. So immediately, uh -huh. immediately what comes to mind is like, you know, this barbaric situation where a five and a half year old just comes over and pushes down a three-year-old and yeah that actually might happen but it's it's much 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 more rare than anybody would ever imagine but the whole concept here and i think you've got you've hit on this and some of the work that you do is that you have to have confidence that children can with a little bit of guidance solve their own dilemmas and conflicts so it's interesting how this is a similar issue with parents being concerned in the classroom at least in a montessori context mm -hmm. and they're just mm -hmm. con they con they want an adult there at all times to make sure not only physically somebody's not hurt but emotionally the child isn't hurt like they aren't quote oh. bullied so I, the feelings always have to be protected at every moment and it's 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 dangerous because you know if my child is is harmed by this older child then you know he's gonna feel horrible and it's like they don't realize that children can actually you know coordinate with one another with some guidance again through some of these dilemmas um so i'm wondering is that you know relevant in the work that you're doing with more broadly outside of the classroom it is so relevant that i came up with like five responses as we were talking and i think i just have to go through them one after the other go for um it. so so let grow is the nonprofit that grew out of free range kids and um so now i'm the president of let grow and we have two school initiatives, and one of them is asking schools to stay open after school for mixed age free play nice. with minimal intervention on the part of the adults. And one of the schools where we've been doing this is out on Long Island of New York. And uh, the principal there, who's getting her PhD, <laughs> decided to study what was the reaction of like what was happening with the kids when they were out there. Playing, and this was kindergarten through fifth grade uh, with the adults not solving the problems and not organizing the games. And uh, it's been very successful and she actually hasn't seen bullying. So I don't, I can't even tell you what is happening with the bullying because it's, it's not there. Um, mm -hmm. But she said that the, when they interviewed uh, the little kids, the littlest kids that, you know, what do you like best about, we call it let grow play club. They said, Oh, it's so fun. But when she asked the older kids, and we're talking about fourth and fifth graders, what they liked best, mm -hmm. they said things like, what I really liked is when um, I taught the little kids a new game. Yeah. Or I really liked it when a kid was standing alone and, and I started playing tag with them. Mm -hmm. Or um, one kid said, I didn't even know I liked little kids. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I, like I can that. understand. You know, they're never around them, you know, yeah, yeah. especially in small families. Yep. So what the kids were saying, with not in these words, is, guess what? Empathy is fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it <laughs> you know, works but, to our advantage to have empathy, and particularly in outdoor games, right? Well, particularly in life. Yeah, if yeah. You, you know, and if you want to have any kind of, I mean, if you want to be a, a sort of successful human being, being able to understand what another person is feeling is, is a really great skill. Yeah. And it's impossible to get, it's not impossible to get, but it's harder to get when you're just with kids your exact own age because mm -hmm. then it's competition. You know, who is the best batter of all the yeah. seven-year-olds? You know, who's the fastest and runner? And but I if you're a twelve-year-old, sorry, if you're twelve-year-old throwing a ball to a to a to a seven-year-old, you're not going to wallop it. 
What's yeah. the point? And I think, you know, and I like because as at 12, you've kind of hopefully developed that skill to know this little child or this seven year old is different than I am. But if you're not around kids, as you were saying, even that skill to understand that this other human being, because of his age or developmental level, is not up to my level is that you have to develop mm-hmm. that understanding. So if if you don't have what you're what you're talking about with this is mixed age after school kind of environment, but with Montessori, we have it throughout the whole day. You don't really yeah, get ex- so you don't get exposure to that kind of development, that mental preparation. And as, and as you said, I like that you're saying empathy actually aids in life. But these children, like I've seen this literally so many times, where a game is being played by kids from a bunch of different ages, and the game will self destruct if the the stronger child does not chill out in terms of the power he puts into the game. Because if he doesn't, then all those little kids are going to be like, I'm not playing this anymore. They just walk away, you know? Right. So, so here's a thought. Um, first of all, absolutely right. Secondly, um, you know, we talk a lot about bullying and this is just riffing here, but is it possible that bullying occurs because that other natural process is, is not happening where kids, have to negotiate between themselves to keep a game going, and so if you're if you're such a jerk that nobody wants to play with you, um, that you realize I better change my. I mean, I don't think you realize it consciously, but you change your behavior a little bit so at least you can still have the fun of playing. Yes. And yep. if there's always an adult mediating or saying like now it's time for us to take turns or we're all going to go to separate places or you know not that there should you know I'm not against adults figuring things out some of the times, but I would like kids to have a little experience yeah. with, you know, negotiating the, the frustrations of life and then the exhilaration, the exhilaration of like helping a little kid learn how to hold his yes, back. Yes. Yes. You know, it's, and I think it's, it's like it's this joy. Why are we taking that joy out of kids' lives and replacing it with just adult led activities? Yeah. And I, th- I like how you're framing it because you're, you're reframing it towards the positive as a way from protecting against the negative. And life is so much, it should be so much about how much positive we can have in our lives as opposed to the whole focus is escaping bad. Um, and it's what, what, <laughs> yeah. what I find kind of fascinating about this is that Obviously, and I think this goes along with the headline kind of culture, is that bullies are usually the emphasis. And I understandably, I think today in today's culture, because we have things like these massive school shootings that are incredibly frightening to parents. And I can understand why, because it's like, I, you know, I send my child to school and he could be, potentially be shot. It's just this immediately emotional thing. But but what I found practically in schools that's a bigger threat than bullies, because bullies, the real bullies are much rarer is a victims. So we we tend, particularly as teachers and then parents with our own children, is we tend to be overly concerned with protecting the feelings of somebody who is being kind of like, I don't like your artwork by another child. You know, there's like a there's there's this almost like gut level need to run up and go, wait, wait, wait. You know, are you, you don't say that towards his artwork. It's beautiful. And you're and it's like this jumping to defense of this quote victim when not really a victim. It's just children talking with one another and they have to figure out what works best as you were kind of getting at, you know? Yeah. I mean, kids will figure it out. And also there's a, I mean, it seems to me that if, if we're rushing to reassure a child that they're not the world's worst artist, like their friend just said or whatever, what we're really worried about is that discomfort will disable a child forever. And so we better um, quickly make it disappear. Otherwise, they're going to be, um, you know, traumatized to the point of not functioning as well as just not functioning. And that is a real insult to the human spirit. And it also is a a misunderstanding of, um, I think, the human development process. So I'm not a psychologist, but Peter Gray, who I read all the time and quote all the time, who's, Hmm. like I said, one of the co-founders of Let Grow, said that children are going to, you know, face hundreds, thousands of frustrations, betrayals, um, unfair experiences, um, you know, losing uh, between the time they're born and the time that they become young adults. And this is actually... Mother Nature expected that. She put the drive to play 
into kids so that they would be always interacting with each other and interacting with the world. And inevitably, some of that was going to be time spent arguing or falling mm -hmm. or crying or saying that's not fair so that by the time they're adults, they've had a lot of practice yeah. doing that. And um, jo so Jonathan Haidt, who wrote, who's a co-author of The Coddling of the American Mind, which is a really popular book right now, is another co-founder of Let Grow. And if you'll let me, I'll just give you the, the, the analogy that he keeps giving when I've, I've heard him speak so many times. He said that there are some things uh, that are fragile, that truly are fragile. If you drop a wine glass on the ground, it shatters, mm -hmm. right? Okay, fragile. There are some things that, like a, like a plastic cup, you drop it on the ground, you pick it up, and it's resilient, okay? It's, it's fine. It's no worse for the wear. No better, no worse. But there are some things, there are some systems that are anti-fragile, which means that they actually get stronger with a little bit of resistance, with a little bit of, um, you know, contention and, uh, you know, or difficulty. And so one of them is the immune system. You know, the immune system has to have germs to attack so that it becomes robust, so it develops the antibodies. And bones are another system. When bones break and they grow back, they grow back stronger. Mm -hmm. And the third system that is anti-fragile is children. <laughs> and that means that they have to, you know, lose and they have to get a bad grade sometimes and they have to be mad at their friend and they have to be, you know, double crossed uh, and they have to fall, literally fall. And, and when they do and they start developing the wherewithal to get back up or to make up with their friend or to go do something else or to practice harder so that they don't lose next time, all these things are great. And when we take out all the discomfort, the frustration, and the losing out of their lives, we're not letting them develop. Just like if yeah. we raised children in a bubble and we expected them to have a robust immune system, they wouldn't. You'd take them out into the world and they would die of TB or whatever. Yeah. So and it's interesting listening to you talk. I mean, so Lenora is not, you know, a Montessorian, but I think one of your, the actual co-founder or executive director is, has her children in Montessori. Is that correct? Or her child? That's, yeah, that's correct. She has okay. a four-year-old in Montessori. So it's, it's so, it, you know, listening to you, it's like Montessori deliberately created a classroom. And I say this often on the podcast and just things that I do is that they, that gives children uh, uh, offers an environment in which children have those challenges and they they're thwarted, you know, but it's just right at a level in which it's not too <laughs> far of a reach because obviously, <laughs> you know, if you give a child too much of a, of a fall, I mean, the physical analogy would be like, if he fell off a cliff, like you don't want that fall. That's but, a bad you know, idea. Exactly. <laughs> so, but Lenore is basically, you're putting forth the idea that you have to have these smaller falls and then you start to develop a sense of, Oh yeah, I, I can fall, but then I get back up because I can keep going. And at the end of those falls, I can stand and, you know, whatever activity they're doing. Um, right. And it's funny listening to you. I just there's a buddy of mine who's like this professional mountain biker, really serious. And he just posted a picture of himself like he's got he's got these bars in his leg now. He's in the hospital and he just oh, no. He, no, but it's not even like he's got a smile on his face. I mean, this when you're a professional biker, it's like you have falls and then you just get. But he says in his picture, he says you fall seven times, you get up eight and it's yeah. just like that type of mentality and the way that you're speaking, Lenore, and saying about the human spirit, that is what we are trying to develop in children. And if you just think about the type of people that are becoming successful today, particularly in, let's say, you know, creating companies and this excitement with creating new things in the world, they fail. If you look back in their oh history, yeah. they fail all the time. I was just at um, the Walt Disney Family Museum and they talk about Walt Disney. He was around 20 and started one at a company. It went bankrupt. His first kind of cartoon company went bankrupt. And and wow. he his response to people that are like serious, he says, yeah, I'm just I'm, a, I'm an experimenter. And it's like that's yeah. we want to be raising experimenters. Like, obviously, we are the guides and we're there in case it's too extreme and we set up an environment. But as you're saying, you got to get children out there to actually experiment, get out in the world and and fall a little bit. Right. So um, so I really appreciate the kind of the approach you're taking, particularly because it's rare that I hear the positive approach to life as opposed to we're trying to, again, we're running away from the negative. And I really appreciate that. So, Oh, I'm glad. Um, yeah. So let me, so can I just tell you the other project? Oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry about it. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. So there's the Let Grow Play Club, which mm -hmm. is, 
you know, uh, the, the free play before or after school where there's an adult on the premises, sort of like a lifeguard at a pool. <laughs> you know, they're not organizing the game, but they're there in case there's an emergency. And it gives kids this chance we were talking about mixed ages, come up with their own games and have fun. Um, the other project that we're doing is called The Let Grow Project. And it is simply this. It is um, all the teachers tell all the kids in the school that their homework for some time in the next week is to go home and do something on their own without their parents. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yes, it's partly for the kids because then the kids decide, you know, I'm going to rake the leaves, I'm going to run an errand, I'm going to, you know, walk to the park, I'm going to get myself to the bus stop, whatever they decide. But it's really for the parents because the parents, unlike we were talking earlier about how my mom let me walk to school because everybody let their kids walk to school at age five, six, seven when I was growing up. And now, we don't have those same milestones visible the way parents did a generation or two ago. And mm -hmm. so they don't know, like, well, is it okay to let my kid walk now? Is it okay to let them on the, you know, to, to play on the front lawn or to, yeah. you know, to run an errand or whatever. But if everyone in the school is doing something like this, you're not the crazy mom who's decided to let her kid walk to the bus stop. Everybody's doing that. And mm -hmm. so when you have a whole community doing it, it just makes it very easy for the parents to finally let go because you've, you've made it normal again. And then when the kid comes back and they, gosh, I've seen this so many times, when the kid comes back with like the, the juice from the store and they bring it through the door, the parents are ecstatic. Yeah. The parents are, are so proud wow. because what are, you, what are you trying to do? You're trying to raise a child who can do things on their own because you're not always going to be there. You know, it's like prepare yeah. the child for the past. And so when you have that feeling of like, look, look at my blossoming kid. This is, this is great. I, I raised this kid. And frankly, this kid will be okay even when I'm not here. That's yeah. like an existential relief. Parents aren't even thinking that way, but somehow it, it sort of unconsciously realized like, then I'm doing my job. This, yeah. You know, why do you raise a kid? You raise a kid so the kid will be there even when you're not. Yeah, and I think and that's... So, I was just going to say, I think that's the, for at least in Montessori and definitely just in my general view of existence here as a parent or even as teachers is the goal is that at one day, you know, they, they, they're outside of the nest on their own flying. Right. So, so right. what you're saying is perfect. And I'll, I'll broaden out your community and just say, you know, we have a lot of Montessorians that listen. So I think a lot of them are doing a lot of these independent activities with their child or letting them go. <laughs> but let's broaden out and just say anybody who's listening and you're a parent, if you have a child, obviously you don't let your two year old go get juice from the store. But, you know, you <laughs> at a certain age, right? Know your context, but do something, com allow him to do her, do something completely independent. And Lenore here is giving you the OK. We've got a community saying everybody is nobody's going to be shamed and see what happens. You know, I'm sure I'll get I'll get a few calls. You know, somebody's gonna be like, oh, I got arrested because my child was out on the subway by themselves you know right we are trying to change the laws too and we've uh utah last year passed a law they called the free range parenting law that says mm -hmm. letting your kid uh play outside walk to school wait briefly in the car under some circumstances or come home with a latch key um will not be mistaken for negligence yeah and but, i wonder um, i wonder if utah because you know Utah obviously there's a lot of you know families out there are much larger kids. a lot of kids yeah. and i wonder if yeah. that's a good example of just the natural growth is that if you have a family of of children clearly the older ones often are actually taking care of the younger ones you know indeed well, yeah and also you can't you know personally take care of five kids if yep. there's one parent or two yep so um but what i wanted to say is um, I do encourage, you know, parents to, to trust themselves and trust their communities and trust their kids. Um, but I do think it's really hard if you're just doing it alone. So mm -hmm. um, doing the Let Grow project through a school is much easier. You just have to, you know, it's a community problem. If you're the only person sending your kid out to the park, they're going to come right back anyhow because it's so boring. Yeah. But if everybody is sending their kids outside, that's a different thing. And, and one thing I wanted to say is so if if your school doesn't do the Let Grow project immediately, um, what we're hoping is that people will come to, um, you know, either our website, which is letgrow.org. We're, we're totally nonprofit. We don't make any money off of any of this. Either come to the website or come to, we have a Facebook page called No More Helicopter Parenting, and we called it that because of SEO reasons, search engine reasons. Um, but at least there you can talk to other people and say, like, you know, I want my kid to play outside, but I can't get him off the couch. Yeah. Or, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of letting my four-year-old play in the front yard. Is that too soon? So it's just so you, at least you have a community online if you don't have a community in your community. Yeah. <laughs> um, doing, you know, thinking about these ideas and, and um, giving their kids some independence. Great. Well, I'm happy you're giving some people some resources here that might aid in, uh, in their own, you know, communities outside of outside of where you are. Because I know, are you doing a lot of this stuff locally or where have you, you're just doing it everywhere? Oh my, everywhere. everywhere. Oh okay. my God. I've, yeah. I've, you know, I've been so, to Australia twice. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, like hither and yon. Yeah. So an, an interesting, by, on, on a quick side note, you know, she, Lenore has been mentioning helicopter parenting and I've seen, you know, this word has been all around and I've mentioned Haim Ganat, who's a hero of mine, but he actually originated that term. And I just, you know, right. it's, it's hard. I'm trying to get this out there because Haim Ganat to me is just one of those amazing individuals. But that term and that just whole perspective is is relatively new. That's not a old school thing where or in, in history where a lot of parents are overly protective of their children. It's a it's a relatively new development, which is fascinating in itself, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so but anyhow, so, well, Lenora, is there anything else you want to throw out there or should we uh, wrap it up here? I think we're hitting. I don't even know what the time is because we've stopped and gone right. back a few I times. Think, but um, an hour. I, you know. Wrap it up. I'm I'm outside here in New York, and it is freezing. <laughs> so I just didn't want to be inside in an echoey hall, and I'm very far from my apartment at the moment. So um, I'm just grateful that you found me and that we got to have this wide-ranging talk. Yeah. And uh, anybody who wants to write to me, feel free. I'm Lenore, L-E-N-O-R-E, at Let Grow. Dot org. Everybody thinks it's Let It Grow, which would be a horrible name, or Let Go. Um, but let it's it let grow. grow. Yeah, really, please. Not yeah, well, you've it. already got all of that publicity. You know, the kids would be singing yeah. your song, Let It Grow. There you go. It'd be perfect. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> nice. But yeah, and I'll put up I'll put up a link on the page to uh, to that site as well. So you can check everybody can check that out. So Oh, thank you, Jesse. That's yeah, yeah. great. No problem. So and good talking with you. I'm I'm happy we did connect. You are you got a lot of knowledge, but you're also just a straight shooter, which I, I love. You know, I don't are you I from try. where are you from originally? The suburbs of Chicago. The suburbs Wilmette, of Chicago. Illinois, yeah. Okay, okay. Cool. Well, I was just interested if there's any kind of, you know, cultural influence on how you just like keep it real. You know, I don't know if that was in your environment. Uh, or you... A bit Western, you know, what can I say? But I, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. Now I think I'm in New York. I don't have any idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how long have you been living in New York? Oh, my God. Like 30 years. I'm curious. Are you seeing young kids walking the streets of New York during the day or no? Or what, what's that environment like? I'm looking around right now. Uh -huh. uh, well, downtown. It's not really a. Yeah, that's good. Uh, no, you know, I mean, I let my, you know, I let my nine year old ride the subway by himself and I wrote a column about it. And that was what was, you know, it, it's not that common. It's not completely uncommon. But, yeah. you know, people here in New York too remember playing in Central Park as kids yeah. or, you know, getting themselves to school by a city bus. And yeah, New York. In New York, you see. Yeah. yeah, and you see a lot of those old school kind of pictures that are just, they look like such joyous oh, times well, on the streets with the kids have, in the water. A, right, there's always a, yeah, a fire hydrant. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> forever spurting. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, most people over age 30 or maybe even 35 at this point um, look like they're pining when they think about their childhoods and how they would get on their bikes and it was freedom and they yeah. would, you know, play outside and ride around till the streetlights came on. And, you know, that's, if, if that's the best part of your childhood, here's the good news. You can give it to your own kids. Yeah. Yeah. If that's and, your thing. And we're trying to give our kids, you know, the best things in life. That's one of them. And, and you can give it back. Yeah. And I think, I, I, I think that's a good way to end. And I'll just add on that, that, we need to give it back to ourselves too. And I think that free range adulting is that like, let us, let us start taking control of our own lives and not waiting for somebody to pass a law to tell us how we should be acting in life, you know? Right, um, right. So. Our lives, our families, our kids. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Lenore. Well, thank you again for coming on and uh, all my, all my best out there in New York. And uh, we'll talk again. Oh, I hope so, Jesse. Thanks so much. Well, that was quite a conversation. I'm, I'm really curious what kind of email I will receive on this one. So in, in kind of wrapping up here, I, I want to highlight one pretty significant point, and that is that idea of freedom within limits. Or as I like to think of it, aiding children to develop the ability to become 
eventually free adults. Now, Lenore actually became relatively well known for attempting to aid in doing just that with her own child. Yeah, as Wikipedia describes it, I kind of looked it up here, quote, her controversial decision to let her then nine-year-old son take the New York City s- subway home alone became a national story and prompted massive media attention, end of quote. Now, I think it's important for each of us to think through whether Lenore's choice was helpful or harmful for her son. Related, I'll, I'll tell you something fascinating that happened to me with something similar to what's going on with Lenore there. So when I used to teach junior high, each year we would take the students to Washington, D.C. And most of these kids, I mean, they loved to learn. They, they actually looked forward to my history class with them. So it wasn't surprising that when we were in D.C., they got, they got really into historical tours. I mean, they, they soaked it all up. Now, when we got back, when we returned from the trip back home, this was in Southern California, parents and other teachers, of course, they're asking you, like, what was your favorite part? They were asking the kids this, you know. Now, the kids' answers kind of shook me, and it's stayed with me since. So the majority of them said their favorite part, again, this is a nearly week-long excursion in D.C., was the one time they rode the subway. So not the monuments or the museums of the Capitol, which they truly enjoyed. This was a blast of a trip. You could could tell and they talked about it. But instead, it was the dirty underground subway. Now, why why is that? Why why did that happen? And I'm going to say it's because of this. Our guide on this overall trip took all of the students there just as one day, gave them each like, I don't know, like $1.25 or something, and saying the name of a place you know they'd never heard of before she just told them we need to get from where we are standing now to to that location and within i don't know it was like 30 minutes that's what she told them and these are kids from southern california i mean a lot of these kids weren't even making their own lunches at home at this point this was more of a traditional school so a few of the kids you know started asking well you know, well how, how do we do that she she just looked at them and said you figure it out. Now, of course, the kids eventually figured it out. I mean, children tend to be much more capable than we imagine. And that one instance where these students were given a unique taste of what I would say is our own adult freedom, that became the favorite part of their DC trip. So this type of thing, helping children to develop the skills to one day become independent individuals, It's one of the most important things we can offer them. And if done right, which I mean, I personally think that Maria Montessori perfected with her approach of freedom within limits for children. um, These kids will appreciate it for as long as they live. They'll look back and just be so thankful for what they got, whether it's, you know, kind of at home you're doing these methods or in the classroom, which, of course, for me, it's Montessori education in the classroom. All right, uh, that is basically what I have for you today. Now, if you want to meet, reach out to me with any comments, questions, you know, this episode, who knows, angry objections, who knows, whatever it is. As always, you can write me, jesse, J-E-S-S-E, at montessorieducation.com. Um, I am backed up with emails. I'm getting a lot of emails, so just be aware. It could be a, it could be a while until I get back to you, but shoot them out, shoot them out. Now, if you'd like to reach Lenore Skenazi, again, this is a woman I think is contributing some great things for both kids and our culture. Reach out to Lenore, that's L-E-N-O-R-E, at letgrow.org. I'll also add her email to the podcast site. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, which, of course, doesn't mean you have to agree with every single thing, please rate the show and leave a comment. Uh, Apple Podcasts in particular is awesome if you could do it there. Now, those are just really helpful in spreading the word. And and I, I just appreciate reading your feedback. It's, it's really meaningful for me. All right. Uh, until next time, adios.